Thanks so much for that. That was such a fine introduction. And it's so wonderful to see all of you. And um, I think that my thinking might be a little bit stuck where it was when Professor Janessereth and I still got together, whereas you have all moved on. So I'm looking forward to a lot of feedback from you. Um, with your indulgence, I'll, before I get to legal, the legal informatics part, I'd like to start just with boilerplate in general and why I wrote a book about it. So. Um, you, you've all clicked, I agree, without reading this stuff, but, but we're seeing really interesting stuff. Um, um, so, so here's one. Okay, so this is, a, this is a parking lot ticket. It's on the back of the ticket, which no one ever reads, and it says, the vehicle for which this ticket is issued is accepted for parking purposes only, and under the following conditions to which the holder hereof assents by receiving this ticket. No responsibility is assumed by the operator of the law for loss from fire, damage, or theft of the vehicle or any articles left in the vehicle or for any damages whatsoever. No employee has any authority to vary any of the above terms. So most of these fine print things are overreaching. In other words, if the employees themselves broke into the car and stole something, it, this probably would not exonerate them. And, and normally when receiving pieces of paper, it doesn't always obligate you to anything. And uh, you could be walking down the street and somebody could shove a piece of paper in your hand and they could say, by receiving this paper, you've agreed to support me to the, to the way I need. You know, it might not happen. So, so this is a typical example and, and one that many of you have seen, I think. Well, I once tried to do that. Yeah, here's a story. I'm glad you asked me that. And please do feel free to ask me questions. I don't intend to lecture for an hour. So, so it has turned out, um, I don't have an example, but there's such a thing, there's a thing that in the law we call an exculpatory clause, which says no matter what I do to you, I'm not liable. And um, the exculpatory meaning it excuses me if my employees are negligent or if they say I'm exculpated for almost everything, and we think maybe the employees could attack you, and theoretically, but not in actual law, you, you wouldn't, they wouldn't be liable. And um, so, so here's a good example of that. I have a very good example of that one, and then, and then I can tell you about draw, trying to draw a line through things. So here, here's my example. So this is pretty small. I can hand it around to look at it. I'm not, I wasn't at home base where I could make the picture larger, but, but this was a hanging sign that was put up outside a public park where the city whose park it was had agreed that a firm could come in and hold an event of some kind. And it says, by entering these premises, you, on behalf of yourself and any minor accompanying you, one, understand that you will be engaging in activities that may involve risk of injury, which might result not only from your actions, inactions, or negligence, but from the actions, inactions, or negligence of others, the condition of the premises, or any equipment used at the event. Two, voluntarily assume all risk and danger of personal injury, including death, and all hazards arising from or related in any way to this event, whether occurring prior to, during, or after this event, however caused, and whether by negligence or otherwise, Three, release, wave, and discharge these firms and their respective parents, subsidiary, and affiliated entities, licenses, agencies, employees, and representatives, here and after collectively referred to as producers. I guess they were running events. From any and all liability and covenant not to sue producers for any and all loss of damage or count of injury to your person or property, whether caused by negligence or otherwise, for grant the right to producers to utilize your image, likeness, actions, name, voice, and statements in per perpetuity in any live or recorded audio, video, or photographic display, or any other transmission, exhibition, publication, or reproduction made of or at this event without further authorization or comp compensation. Five, release and discharge producers from any and all claims arising out of use of any images or footage taken at this event, including any claims for libel and invasion of privacy. OK, so, so now your question was whether we could cross out some of that if you've got it on a piece of paper. So. I believe but can't prove that insurance companies, when they insure something like a summer camp for kids or a fitness center for me to go and work out, I believe that the insurance company won't give them insurance unless the, the fitness center promises to give me an exculpatory clause saying, I will not sue you if you hurt me. So I once got one of those at a fitness center and I tried to cross it out 
because I knew it was unenforceable. I mean, if they hurt me on purpose, it's unenforceable anywhere. There's a lot of law which makes it a little bit more dicey if they're merely negligent in hurting you. But if they hurt you on purpose, that there's no place, there's no state that would permit that to be enforced. So, so I tried to cross out the part that was unenforceable, and she said, no, no, no. You know, spoil my insurance. So, so from that I inferred, and from several other episodes like this, where I was told I was the only person that ever read the form that was given to me, I was I inferred that insurance companies may actually be trying to have it both ways. They may be saying, "I'll give you insurance if only you'll you'll make your customers have to buy their own insurance, and we won't ever have to cover you for anything." Um, that I don't can't prove that. So. Those of you who are watching this on video, don't think I've asserted this as a fact. <laughs> Just anecdotal evidence. Um, another example that we're seeing is um, fine print that tries to tell the court what to do with things that used to be in the court's discretion. How many of you are law students? Okay, quite a few. So, so you know that, that making decisions in equity are the province of the judge, right? So here is this uh, World of Warcraft EULA end user license agreement, and it says, you hereby agree that Blizzard would be irreparably damaged if the terms of this license agreement were not specifically enforced. Okay, I, you probably can't do that either, but worth a try, right? Um, so what else have I got to show you in the boilerplate world as an example? Um, yeah, this is one of my favorites, too. This was my mother-in-law's contract that was offered to her by a financial firm for her retirement funds. In the end, after she asked me to read it, which took me 10 hours, it caused her to take her money out of that firm. Um, but one of the things it said was, you agree that all claims or controversies, whether such claims or controversies arose prior, on, or subsequent to the date hereof between you and this company, or any of its present or former officers, directors, or employees concerning or arising from one, any account maintained by you, blah, 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 to any transaction involving this company or any professor, predecessor firms, blah, blah, blah. Three, the construction, performance, or breach of this or any other agreement between us, any duty arising from the business or otherwise, shall be determined by arbitration before and only before any self-regulatory organization or exchange of which we are a member. So, and um, that one, my, my son became a lawyer and helped me find these, and that one caused a giggle. And it actually caused my mother-in-law to change firms. So, so that, is, that, that brings me a little bit to what I want to talk about today is, is consumer pushback. I mean, if, if you got one of these, would you push back? Would you say, I don't want to deal with a firm that's going to try and do this? And if you were wanting to do that, could you do that? In, could you use technology to help you do that? And, and that's what I'm interested in exploring. Um, OK, so the book. I don't mean this to be a shameless plug for the book, but I guess it is one. Uh, the, the book is, is being published in, in really old-fashioned print with old-fashioned time delay by Princeton University Press uh, coming out in November. And, um, and it, it has four parts. Um, um, the, the middle part is about boilerplate, the fine print, basically, and contract theory. And, and the rationales and rationalizations that people use to say that these are contracts. One of the things that underlies my book is that I don't think all of these should be thought of as contracts. It doesn't mean that they're all illegal. It just means that, that they don't really fit the template of what looks like a contract because none of these are freely consented to under whatever we think of as the regime of private ordering. They're, they're something else. And so I have some something else theories. I don't think they're all, you know, but I, one of the things I hope is that we won't routinely call them contracts, even if we call them contracts of adhesion or some other type of thing. Um, so there are rights that are lost or undercut that are essential to rule of law, which come within some of these boilerplates. And, and especially, I think, are 
those things which are part of the right to redress of grievances because if we don't have any right, I mean, it, it may not be that we're going to sue them, but if we don't have any right to have the legal system police these things in some way and, and you can just put anything on a piece of boilerplate and change people's rights quickly, then we might have a difficulty with rule of law and that's why the rule of law is in the title of my book. Um, Part two of this book is boilerplate and contract theory, which I call rationales and rationalizations. Um, those of you who have taken contract are, have heard about all this, and um, I've got a chapter on philosophy of contract, the autonomy and welfare theories, and, and that re replicates my, my cheat sheet on law and economics. I'm not sure what Professor Craswell would think of it, but it's been helpful to a bunch of students because it goes over what the premises are and, and how we might argue from there to, to finding that something is or isn't a good idea. And, um, and I talked about in that, I talk about the theories of contract and those who validate boilerplate under those theories. And so that I'm not going to talk about today either just to tell you what's in the book. But, but traditionally what we do in contract law, if we think that something is overreaching, like you might think for one of these, we, we go toward unconscionability or void as, a, void as against public policy. And we might think, for example, that the one that says you and your child, if you have any child with you, just by walking along here, risk death at our hands, no matter whether we're negligent or otherwise. We might think that that's overreaching and void against public policy if they ever tried to enforce that. So, so that's what that's what those things do. And and I think that it would be better, <coughs> and uh, and I think it would be better instead of saying. Um, procedural and substantive unconscionability and reasonable expectations and all that stuff, I think we should think about the nature of the right, whether it's something which people can't waive, like their right to redress of grievances and or some other things like maybe the right of fair use is maybe something that we can't contract out of, even if companies want to do that. And I, I think so, the nature of the right, the, the quality of the consent, like how much do we think somebody really meant to agree to anything and the, the and the the thing that I want to add to that is the mass market aspect, the extent of the social dissemination of these things. If, 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 um, if only one person is deprived of something important, that's probably not good. But if a million people are deprived of something important by somebody's EULA, then that becomes a social problem. And I, and I want to tell you about that. Um, so in part four, which I called Escaping Contract, which is the title of this talk, um, I was thinking there may be other things to do with these to keep them cabined to a place that is good or is efficient or is justifiable besides calling them contracts and trying to think one by one whether somebody agreed in a bargain for exchange, which, which I think doesn't work very well without gerrymandering the justification. So I tried to think of other ways. And, and what I'm going to talk to you about is, is whether users could push back in ways that were not just in technological ways, although I think we could think of some of those. And that, that's why we're here, but in, in various ways. Um, and I also, um, just to be radical, um, wrote a chapter on maybe, uh, this is a very old idea, not as radical as all that. Maybe some of these fine print things are more like a tort than a contract, um, either a defective product or, or something. I think it should be an intentional tort, an intentional deprivation of important legal rights. So, so um, but, but what I found just, this is my last introductory comment, and, and um, thanks for your patience. Um, I think that when we have mass market overreaching fine print that's laid on people, I call them recipients rather than contracting parties because I think most of us are receivers of this stuff rather than agreeers in the, in the contractual sense. And, and I think that there are two things which result from that um, for our, which are not good for our legal system. One I called normative degradation and the other I called democratic degradation. So what I mean by normative degradation is that the theory of contract says we have a bargain for exchange, both parties at least consented, it's voluntary. And, and that 
devolves, if you will, into ascent and then blanket ascent, a term of Carl Llewellyn, and then the mere opportunity to ascent. You got this and you could have seen it, you didn't, because you didn't click on it, but the judge is going to decide whether or not you could have seen it. And then finally, hypothetical ascent, like any, like a <coughs> rational person would have agreed to this because it saves the firm money and the firm is passing on savings to consumers and consumers who were rational economically would have picked it rather than having the right to sue them or something. And, um, and that, how many of you know what property rules and liability rules are? Okay, and he does, okay. All right. Well, so a property rule is when you get to decide whether you part with something that you own or that you have a right to, and, and you could decide not to. A liability rule is where you get paid off, but you don't get to decide. They take it. It's usually the government, like when they condemn the house for a freeway. And um, that's called a liability rule. And, and um, so if you believe the rationale that most of these are fine because Firms are lowering their prices because they, and people would rather have that. <clears throat> that that's hypothetical consent. And if you think, regardless of whether people agreed or not, or don't know what they'd rather have because they don't care, they just click, I agree. And if you think they're somehow being paid off for relinquishing things, that's a liability rule. So, so the, this rationale turns a lot of property rules where we have a right to sue people and a right to various remedies into liability rules which firms can condemn for us by handing us boilerplate. And, and I, I do argue that because I, uh, you'll see, um, but I won't argue it more today, but you can ask questions about it. I, I think that that is a normative degradation because we believe that we have rights to certain things and we believe that we're consenting and trading them and that's what, that's what makes something a justifiable contract. And so it's a degradation to think it could be a contract without that underlying basis. And, and so if you want to defend these things, you can go under freedom of contract, which is basically autonomy theory. We implement our freedom by engaging in contracts and, and we normally call that private ordering. And we're committed to a private ordering system. We're committed to the idea that we can, if we have certain things we own or have a right to, we can trade them for things that we like better, provided that we're doing it under freedom of contract. And, and the limits of that are, um, the, and, and the idea is if you, wanna, uh, if you want to apologize for all, apologize as in the sense of defend, if you want to defend most of these boilerplate terms as being contractual freedom, you'd say people who are clicking I agree have assumed the risk that there's something in there that's going to be nasty. And, and a lot of the literature says that in addition to saying they probably made out better having the rights condemned, which they are never going to use and getting, it, getting the product for less. That has some empirical assumptions. That, so if you're doing this under political economy or economic theory, you're assuming everybody's rational. Um, which may not be true. People are not very rational about thinking whether they're ever going to have to sue anybody. Most of us think that bad things happen to other people and not to ourselves. That's it's called heuristic bias. Um, and there are also empirical assumptions in this argument about whether enough people have enough information about what they're getting to make the market price be the right price, and there are assumptions about market structure and so on. So, and there are normative assumptions about whether the right is something that can be really traded for dollars, which I'm not going to stress right now, but it's an important thing to know about, too. And that, that's perhaps fair use is one of those, and certainly some other ones are. I don't think that you could trade your <coughs> entire right for redress of grievances for a dollar amount or your entire right for freedom of speech for a dollar amount and so forth. Um, so the limit of autonomy theory is things that you reasonably expect normally and, and that is very ambiguous because if I live in a world of these things in which in which lots of these things purport to excuse employees for trying to kill me. I don't think they'll be enforceable, but I, I reasonably expect that those are going to be in there. Empirically, I do. But if I think I should have a right in any <coughs> realistic society that people don't put these things in, in enforceable documents, then I'm, I may expect normatively that that not be done to me. So that's what I mean by normative degradation. And, and the last preamble is democratic degradation, which I think stems from 
the mass market use of these things. And especially when we're in an electronic world, it's very easy to, not only is it easy to push this to a million people and, and have them all purportedly bound by it if they want to buy anything, it's also easy for firms to copy each other. There's a whole lot of copycat boilerplate out there. Have you noticed that? How many people have noticed copycat boilerplate? They all seem to, yeah. So I don't, you know, copycat, well, just as an aside, copycat boilerplate could be a good thing too, not just a bad thing, because if, if some firm had a really user-friendly agreement that it found useful to attract customers and give it a good rep reputation, and and if a court or several courts in different states said, and this is perfectly okay, it's defensible, it's enforceable, and furthermore, we think it's fair, good for you, everybody copies that, that's just fine. It, 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 becomes, a, it becomes a network externality in the good sense. It becomes a, it becomes a network benefit. All right, but, but meanwhile, um, we have a democratic degradation because if the legislature passes something, like let's say, like let's say user rights and copyright, um, <clears throat> things that you can't copyright, like and things that by by long use are not copyrightable, like things that are too short and titles and and things that are actually in a statute, like fair use. Um, if you could just by using fine print take this away from millions of people, you're derailing the legislative process in a certain sense. It, so, so the legislative acts kind of become almost a sham if if a firm all the time they're lobbying through, you know, all the time they're arguing and trying to pass legislation think, well, we could compromise here, but we could take some of this back with boilerplate later. So that so that I think is a democratic degradation. And and then more controversially, um, and this is my last introductory comment that there there's going on now a privatization of systems that are quote, properly public, that is in the care of the polity. And, and that is a very controversial thing to say, what types of things really have to remain public and can't be privatized. I mean, I'm not talking about private armies and I'm not talking about private police and that's all controversial. All I'm talking about is um, privatization of things that, um, that you get in boilerplate. So, so, what's, so why is any of it properly public? And, and you could use the traditional rationale, or you could even use an, an economic, um, political economy rationale. The traditional rationale, which is usually called liberal political theory, is that in order to have private ordering, which, which is really one of the justifications for having a state, having a government at all, is to be able to have private <coughs> ordering, to be able to set up realistic markets that can be run in a good way. And we have to have some backdrop so that whenever someone cheats or coerces somebody, that's not enforceable. And whenever somebody has a perfectly good contract but try to renege, that is enforceable. So we need a backdrop which um, is a legal system which uh, is the entity that's supposed to enforce things that actually are valid and refuse enforcement for those that are actually invalid. And we don't have rule of law if we don't have that. We have kind of free-for-all, which sometimes called the state of nature. So, so that's the traditional rationale that, that if, if everybody, if, if firms all think, I can just take back all these rights, like this uh, World of Warcraft seems to think they can take back the idea that damages is the, is the remedy and say, well, we, we want you to agree in advance to specific performance, and that's, that's not what our legal system says, although other legal systems are, are uh, somewhat different. Um, it, it makes an inroad on what we think is properly public. And, and I think even if we are um, wanting to do this with an economic rationale, um, I think this happened. This may have happened with the Copyright Act, and even if it didn't, it's a good story. Um, so the the story is, if it's if it's just a story, the, the, although my colleague at University of Michigan, Jessica Littman, did a lot of <coughs> research on this and thinks it's not just a story. But let's suppose the firms would really like, in a firm in an ideal world, would like to not have to give any information or knowledge that it develops to any other firm, but would like to be free to take from all other firms to develop stuff of their own. 
Well, if they all try to do that, we degenerate into a free-for-all pretty quickly. So the solution to that is, this is usually called a coordination problem. The solution to that is everybody agrees you can take some information from other firms and they, you, in return, they, you can take some of mine. Other firms can take some of mine. So that is a solution to a coordination problem. And if, you, if the Copyright Act is enacted to make that happen, then you shouldn't be able to get out of it with boilerplate because that's what we call defection. That's saying, OK, we entered into this coordination, and now one firm wants to defect. So you could even tell a story, at least I can tell a story, by even by a political economy rationale, we could have democratic degradation if we can't make coordination solutions which got legislative stick. OK, so, so that's the end of the introduction. And, and um, now, the, the, the topic that I posted, um, in, in part four of this book, I'm, I'm talking about escaping contract, but maybe it's only a way of improving contract. Uh, um, it, people would, many people in this country, and, and not just technologists, would like to have market solutions for some of these boilerplate issues. Um, uh, they would appeal those kind of solutions not just to people who want market solutions in general for most everything, although there are a fair number of those. But there's also, there are companies and entrepreneurs who would profit if there were markets. That you, you guys could go out there and invent some way for me to protect myself from having to receive dangerous boilerplate. <coughs> and if you do that, I'll buy your product. And, and that'll be good. I'd be, if you have one already, I'd be happy to buy it. So um, this, is, this is chapter 10 of the book. And um, there are some ideas about this. One is, and not all of them are technological, but some are. So, so one is, reputation matters a lot. So, and in some industries more than others, um, there are such things as electronic seals of approval and there are such things as watchdog groups that collect these things online and, and, and persuade users to send them in and make, and make lists and disseminate them. Um, internet users could in themselves get involved. I, you know, a, a crowdsourcing solution may be a good one. All of us have seen these. We might actually set up a clearinghouse where we say, OK, this, is, this, this particular boilerplate has received a rating of 5.7 from 35,000 users. Be, and, and so that, and, and I think, and at least my son, who's more computer literate than I am, said it could easily appear like a lot of other icons on your screen. If, if, if you're about to buy something from a, a company that is imposing something which a lot of other users haven't liked. So, so I, I, I'm not a. I'm obviously not a computer engineer, but some of you are, and it might not be too hard to do that. Um, there's the idea, another idea is rating agencies um, that could be organized for the purpose of reviewing and rating the terms. So it could be not, I mean, I like the crowdsourcing idea because it, re, it, it relates to users themselves, but it could be also setting up a, a another type of agency like a, an NGO, non-governmental organization. And, um, and I've thought for a long time um, about filtering approaches or machine bargaining. Um, and I want to come back to that. A, an important tool in the private market world is reputation. So, and, and in fact, um, since Professor Croswell is here, I'll say he's written really excellent work about how sometimes reputation, you know, the risk of loss of firm's reputation is the best deterrent there is and you won't need anything else. So, so that depends on what type of market it is and so forth. But if, I, if, if, if there were watchdog groups or, or maybe just, just um, crowdsourcing, just um, lots of users, with, and, and lists of onerous terms were developed that users might wish to avoid. I would like to avoid anybody who wants me to buy my own insurance when they're also paying for insurance. So I think that's not so good. So I'd like to avoid that. Firms might not want to be on that kind of a list because that kind of a list might hurt the firm's reputation with the customers. Uh, it might. And, and, and so firms may instead want to say, 
we're a firm, we're one of the good guys, we've developed best practices, here they are, we're transparent, we don't have anything to hide with this, and, and that might be a good reputation. And so it, it might be that, that um, reputation will help a lot, especially if markets develop for ways that will enhance the amount of information that's out there about what the reputation should be. Because one of the things that, that goes wrong with these types of um, regimes is that nobody reads them until it's too late. I mean, I mean, if you receive one of these and, and then somebody harms you and, you and you say, can't I sue somebody, and you take it to a lawyer, the lawyer's going to say, well, no, you got, you got this thing. It's probably going to be interpreted as a contract. It says you can't sue anybody. It says you have to arbitrate in some faraway place or whatever it says. And, and if they're an honest lawyer, they might have to tell you that. So, so, so one of the things that, I mean, it, it, there's, it's hard to persuade people that they need information about some of this stuff because, as I said before, there's, there are these things called heuristic biases where people um, don't actually believe that they're ever going to need legal remedies and, and they believe that bad things happen to somebody else. And once they're dealing with a company and dealing with boilerplate, they'll keep doing it because they stick to the status quo. And there's a long list of these that make it a little harder to try and get people to care about information. Um, but all of which is to say there are some firms in some kinds of markets where this is less true. And, and those are markets that where the firm has to be especially cognizant of maintaining good relationships with users and therefore responsive to the threat of reputational harm. And, and I think there are three characteristics of firms like this, so you're welcome to say there are four or two. You know, um, A former professor here, a, a, a friend of mine, Professor Kathleen Sullivan, used to say there were three points to everything, and she was, she was a fabulous teacher. But there could be four or two. But here's the three I think they are. Um, this, the firms that are um, especially sensitive to threat of reputational harm. One would be firms that have a business model that requires the presence of users who participate continually. So if, a, if your participants get turned off, it, it really goes downhill quickly. Um, two, though, <clears throat> is a likelihood that the users are reasonably savvy about issue of user rights, such as data privacy or information copying in particular. And three would be the need to survive in a reasonably competitive market structure. So if we don't have one of those three, if, if some of those are missing, it's harder to, to get people to care about what's in there. But um, the firms that require the presence of users who participate continually are online sites whose revenues are derived from delivering advertising to the eyeballs of users. That's not the only one, but that's one. And so when you want to say um, firms like Facebook, firms like Google, firms like lots of them, they really don't want the users to get pissed off. I mean, to excuse me, video camera, they don't want the users to get angry. Uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, and they want the users to be angry, and so that is a bit that that at least is a business model where uh, the reputational harm thing may work, especially if technology is developed to to collect user input about how how this how how people feel about this, and um, and user right people who are reasonably savvy about their user rights are firms with online business models. Primarily because the users of those firm services are likely to be experienced computer and software users, and and they're likely to have some awareness of user rights, um, especially involving intellectual property, data privacy, and, and and maybe even remedies. And and so those users may push back just by complaining, that and they also could exit if their desires are ignored and and. Uh, firm in this position particularly wants to avoid that. So, so those are considerations conducive to consumer pushback that have more relevance if the market is reasonably competitive um, because the incentive to avoid reputational harm is likely to be muted in non-competitive markets. That is, if you're stuck with the firm even if they have a lousy <laughs> reputation, um, they don't have as much of an incentive. Um, and. Uh, 
And uh, the, it seems to me, at least to date, that farms that don't have as much of an incentive include cell phone service providers. Um, they have apparently been less responsive, although not completely so, but they've apparently been less responsive to widespread consumer unhappiness with their contracts. How many of you are unhappy with your cell phone provider? Is anybody in this firm unhappy with their cell phone? I, I am, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, it's a few of you. All right, and um, you know, when I tell people I, I'm doing a book about form contracts, they tell me in awesome detail about how terrible their cell phone contract is. That's the first one that they pick. And it's not because they read it before clicking I agree, though. It's because they later got hurt by it, and sometimes repeatedly. So the, uh, I, I don't have an example, but, um, but we know that AT&T's contract, for example, says that they have a right to modify it unilaterally whenever they feel like it. And, and just inform you. So they modified, and their, their only remedy is arbitration. There's a Supreme Court case on that. So you can't have a class action, of course. You can't, if you've lost $3 a month, you've just lost it because you can't, there's no way to aggregate the remedy anymore, really. I'm overstating to some extent, but it's been, it's definitely been um, cut back on. And so, so, um, I, this, my own story is I thought, well, I'm writing a book on this. I think I'll take my cell phone company to arbitration and see what that would be like. Um, but I didn't because I thought this would be such a hassle and for what? And I think that lots of people say that to themselves, right? And especially since every once in a while there's someone who won't, right? They'll say, boy, it's worth it to me. I'd really like to take them to arbitration and fight this through. And, and win the $750 that they're going to offer me if I can win the arbitration. Because they, they change, how many of you experience this? They change their data plan so that users on the same contract with you had to, you were running up big bills. This goes for your kids if you have any. I don't know if any of you have any kids, but it goes for, um, it goes for, they were uh, people who used a lot of music, not me, but, but, but kids in my purview. They started charging a lot for the data, whereas before they didn't, and they modified that sort of by themselves because they were allowed to do that. And and um, if you push back, they say, too bad, we have the right to modify. But um, we can't go to another company because that will probably be the same thing. Um, now, cell phone companies do want to keep their customers, you know, they, they give you fine print I mean, the big ones do anyway, that locks the customers in, such as large fees for failing to stick with the service provider for two years. But, but they're not, they apparently, the customers are not so savvy about the system and its parameters to the degree that users of social network sites are and um, users of Google and Facebook and so forth. And it, and it seems like the market for cell phone services is not competitive to the extent, I, I'm hesitant about that because competition might be coming in, but it's not competitive at least to the extent it would be needed in order for consumer preferences to matter enough to change the practice. And, and also, um, it, it's possible that, that as the, the consumers do care about the lock-in, and, and so you see signs by the side of the road now, um, Cell phone, no contract, and so so that's good. But but you're you're never going to get people to comp to care about consequential damages or or remedies because they don't think they're ever going to have to sue anybody. So the nature of what is the kind of harm that's happening matters too. Um, now, in addition to cell phone providers, other providers that have been generally known to have onerous terms are. ISPs, banks, and other financial firms. And financial firms and banks in the consumer arena may now have some, some limits put on them by the government, but I'm not talking about, in this talk at least, I'm talking about pushback by users and in private markets and not by the government. Um, so private watchdog groups and user pushback are less likely to be efficacious against banks and financial firms and even ISPs if those are not firms that are in a competitive enough market with savvy enough users who might want to actually be able to do this and be able to make a difference. So, um, so um, all right. So as far as 
Does you have any questions so far? I seem to be lecturing too much. Roland. So, uh, <laughs> just on the cell phone example, yeah. um, I'd be interested if there, if there are any studies that look into what the role is of like you know, these uh, uh, significant price reductions that yeah. consumers get for the, for the actual devices. Yes. Yeah. In terms of accepting or being more That's prone right. to accepting That's right. those terms. Yeah, it is said by it is said by by people sympathetic to the plight of the phone companies that they're paying Apple six hundred dollars for the iPhone and giving it to me for next to nothing if I'll give them a two year contract and and so that you know if the consumers don't like that and they'd like to get out of it it's Apple's fault not primarily the or at least both of them not. It's not all due to the cell phone provider. Whether there's a study, though, I'm not aware that there's a study. I'm aware of, what do you call it, anecdotal evidence. Like, do you have, do you have information about this, Mark? No. No, OK, I thought you were going to. Okay. I'll go back to a different question. Oh, go ahead, OK. I think. Are you ready? Yeah. So I mean, I, the, it seems to me there are kind of two different potential problems uh, uh, mixed together here in, in the examples we give. One is the. Uh, stretching of a traditional theory of a bargain beyond its bounds, right? The yeah. idea that when you handed me a piece of paper by, by, by uh, not jumping back and staying away from it, I've somehow agreed to whatever's on the piece of paper seems crazy from a traditional contract mm -hmm. theory. Um, but the other set of problems, it seems to me, has to do with, I mean, you refer a couple of times to heuristic biases, but you might also just think about um, the number of different decisions one would actually have to make if one wished to negotiate over all of the elements of, say, a cell phone contract. Right. Uh, and most of those things are not likely to be salient uh, right. uh, to people either because of a bias. They should pay attention to it, but they don't. Or maybe because of rational ignorance, right? Because yeah. I'm not actually likely to care right. uh, whether or not it's litigated in California or Nevada. Right. Um, if I think it's extremely unlikely, I'm going to go to litigation. And so if we thought the problem was the first one, right, we could probably solve that problem pretty easily within contract law. That is, we could get people to, we, we, could, we could get information mechanisms that actually told them in advance, here's what you're being asked to agree to, and gave them an option. Mm -hmm. My sense is that even when we do that through mechanisms like the click wrap license, right, the website that allows you to click here to see all of the terms, it doesn't actually change people's behavior. Right. No one reads the stuff, no one actually fails right. to click. And so that suggests to me the problem is more systemic, that it's the second issue, right, that uh, people may be disadvantaged by a bunch of terms that have been put in front of them. Um, but whether they know about them or not is not going to be the problem. Uh, yeah. And then I guess the question is, well, what do we do about that? Yeah, so very, lots of great things in that question. Um, one is, you're, you're clearly right. There is such a thing as, as never caring about negotiation because it would take forever and it's not that important one way or the other. And, and the risk of it harming you is not a big risk, although they will, once they deal with a million people, harm some of them. So there's a risk to society at large, but not to you personally. So one of the things I'd like to do is to, is to, is to say, let's not deal with this under contract law. Let's deal with it under law, but let's deal with it under regulation, or let's deal with it under tort law, or let's deal with it some other way. There is the prevalent theory among law and economics people, as some of you know and some don't, is to say all this stuff is just a part of the product that you're buying. And so you're buying a product, and it's got a hard drive that has certain capacity, and it's got um, you know, uh, a certain type of software which, which which may get boxed up, but it's got a certain it's got certain characteristics of speed for you, and you're also buying a product that comes with a clause that says you have to litigate in Nevada, or you have to arbitrate, or you instead um, say that um, under the Uniform Commercial Code, you're the they the companies are allowed to exclude consequential damages if, if it's not for personal injury and limit what you can get to whatever you paid for the product. So, so you see that everywhere. And so you could say, OK, I'm buying a product that has a particularly not great hard drive and particularly not great clauses. And, and I call this the contract as product theory. And it's very prevalent among people who do economics. So, so if you buy this product, 
what you then want to say if you're going by economic theory and have it be rational is you then have to say these people are paying the appropriate price for a product that has these characteristics. And we don't, just a moment, we don't require in markets that everybody know every characteristic of a product before they decide to purchase a product. We just hope that a market will arrive at the right price for it. But for markets to arrive at right prices for things, number one, you have to charge everybody the same price, but let's assume that, or you know, at least the appropriate segment. And, and number two, you have to have enough people who know what's in there so that, so that the whole market can price it. And, and I think the problem that we're having, now I'm getting to the answer to your question finally, is that I think with a lot of these, we don't have a big enough segment of this market that could, in fact, price this product properly because I think we don't have enough people who actually know what's in there and, and, and what the result is. I also think, uh, you know, so that's the, that I think is the main answer to that, but, but you're, this, is the, this is a good track. Another reason why, I, I'm not sure that they should be called contracts, and this is one reason why. I wouldn't mind calling them products and just saying, okay, but there's product law, right? And let's see how that goes. But, but also, if we have, um, products on the market in a mass market sort of way that are undermining some things that we thought were important to how the social order is going to work, then that seems to me worse than one person who can't negotiate. Because I, I think that's not the most important part of the problem, really. So it's a societal problem, not an individual problem, I think. Yes, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. I, no, no, no. It's all, it, uh, I just wanted to mention if you're looking at the contract as product. Yes. We would like to have options, yeah. so I certainly can go figure out whether I want to upgrade my hard drive, and I wouldn't mind being able to say yes. I would, you know. And I, I understand you're saying that the complexity might overwhelm people, but yeah. certainly we can go to Fry's and get some, or not Fry's, get some advice on what kind of machine yeah. we might want to buy. And it's not that unreasonable that if that's considered product, yeah. somebody's going to tell us, yeah. "Here's your common clicks that you want." Because I would pay more to get less advertising, for sure. Yeah. And I would pay more not to have arbitration clauses, but I can't even have my retirement account anywhere without arbitration clauses. So I would pay more. Yeah, yeah. this is an interesting idea that I think I first thought about when I talked to Michael Genesareth in the beginning when Codex first got started. And, and that is, we could have, through technology, we could have customization of transactions. So. Um, we do this offline, you know, you could get Apple Care, pay them extra. You could buy the extended warranty on the car or the washing machine, pay them a little extra. You could think that's worth it to you. And, and you could, in fact, buy a better hard drive and upgrade. So why couldn't we, when we're buying a product online, could the checkout process say, look, I, I'm willing to pay a dollar three extra to extend the warranty or to keep you from disclaiming the warranty and I'm going to pay, I'll be willing to pay an extra 52 cents to have dispute resolution by litigation rather than arbitration if I needed it and, and so forth. And, and the interesting idea about that as a technological solution is uh, there are plenty of things that might be uninteresting about it. The interesting thing about it is uh, the amount that I should pay for each clause and what should be the total charge for the contract with the clauses that I selected could be outsourced in real time to some actuarial intermediary, which is done all the time for things that people buy. So, so the customized terms could be presented to me as soon as I'm ready to check out, because they will know that today is worth 52 cents if you want to litigate rather than arbitrate. But if some case comes down that's, that's opposed to firm practice, it might be worth 57 cents tomorrow, right? And so, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I have a student try and write a paper on this and research why we don't have it yet, because it seems to me that it's pretty feasible. And so there may be reasons why we don't have it. Um, maybe they're hard to develop because I, obviously I'm not an engineer, but it's possible that nobody thinks there's a market for these type of things, and, and maybe that, maybe it's because Nobody thinks any, people think nobody really cares at all what's inside the boilerplate, or at least firms believe that they don't. And, and so, and a lot of times they don't care until something goes wrong. So, you know, so, so maybe that's the reason. But I've wondered for a long time why we don't do this. 
Now, it may be a bad idea for a social reason, which I could go into, and in I will in a minute. But I, you were about to well, say something. Kind of thing, the user complexity. Yeah. Uh, Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There are ways to set up a profile. There are ways to set up a filtering system. There are ways to have, I could, I mean, it would be great if we made it a standard and it came with computers and all I had to do was turn it on. I could still exercise choice, but if it were standardized, I could turn it on and I could put in my profile and I could say, please don't show me anything that has an arbitration clause and we could tag them. I know we have technology to do that. And please don't show me anything that says I can't litigate in my home state. We could do that if I wanted to. And I know that that wouldn't be so hard because we could set up a profile. So, so I'm not sure why we don't do that. I, I'd love to have input about what you think about that. Um, but um, and where was your, you had another question and I've now forgotten in my enthusiasm for that one. You, I think. All right. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you then, I'll tell you a bad, a possible bad social outcome of doing this sort of stuff and see what you think about it. So, so if, if we said people like me who are, you know, I have plenty of free time because I'm a professor and, and I have, I like to think about these things and, and so I, I'm, and I have enough money, they pay me well. So I might say it's worth this to me to have better protection. But people who are poorer might say, I have to take the worst contract because otherwise I can't buy anything. And so there is an argument that's out there already um, where people say firms have to give these terrible contracts because they save money. And if they don't save money on, on what, who, whether consumers can sue them, then there's going to be a whole class of poor people at the bottom of the demand curve that can't buy anything, which is worse. So that argument is already out there. And it's possible that by letting people like me buy better protection, the firms would offer even worse contracts and let people like me buy better terms. And the, and the, the ones for everybody else would get worse and worse. So, so I, there may be a social downside risk to implementing such a thing. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm reluctant to predict things that are empirical by just armchair speculation, but there is a possibility of, of such a thing happening. Okay. Now, the fact that people don't, that it looks like there's no market demand for these things, which many of you think would be obvious, the filtering type system is obvious. Um, the setting up a profile, I mean, you even could have people that looked at lots and lots of sites or you could do it with crowdsourcing and you could rate them and the ratings could come to me and I, you know, all of that seems very easy to do. So why don't we do that? Um, well, if we think that nobody cares, then we're really back to the heuristic bias sort of thing. Uh, if, if, if nobody thinks that they're going to have an unexpected loss, or that they're going to have to sue someone, then maybe nobody thinks it's worth it to develop these systems, even though implementing them might not be that expensive. And uh, I don't know whether the legal system should try to do something about this type of bias or, or not. Um, in other words, I don't think there's a consensus answer about whether we should try and help people care about things that they don't know to care about. So I'd like to find out what you think about all this before we run out of time. So I think I'll stop there. But who has questions or comments or consumer pushback <laughs> in the back? I have a question about uh, whether your research or the work that you've done has uh, come up with any answers for the situations where um, people are signing away kind of fundamental rights, First Amendment rights, fair use rights. I mean, I work with filmmakers who can't, can't obtain the uh, film footage that they need without agreeing to a, uh, um, you know, adhesion yeah. terms that say you will never use this without our permission. Yeah. Or academics obviously sign those to do research at libraries and that kind of thing. And, and what the solutions are as far as pushing back against uh, that, you know, yeah. that kind of waiver, um, which isn't a fear that 
you can't sue, it's that you will be sued, so. Yeah. You know what, I'd, I'd love to hear suggestions about how we could do that um, in the world of reputation and private pushback and, and technological implemented solutions, but I have developed uh, what I think is a better template for judges to use if they ever get one of these before them. And, and, um, and that, I think, is that um, there should be three things for a judge to consider, three aspects of the situation. The first one is the nature of the right that's being waived. There are some things that we're not allowed to sell, and there are things that we should only be able to sell with great scrutiny, too. I mean, and, and I would think that free speech rights are, are one of them. And I would think that rights to some reasonable remedy is also one of them. I mean, if, if we waive our remedies down to the bone, like the most I could ever get is $3 for repair or replacement, but, in the, but actually this thing has been blowing up and ruining everybody's data, and, and so there's a whole lot of consequential damage, it, it looks like that's an important right to a realistic remedy, which mass market waiver is taking away. So there, I think there are some rights um, which shouldn't be so readily tradable, and therefore, I think if you're a judge, you should say, I'm going to weigh this more heavily because it's a more important right. So that's the first analytical category, which I hope judges will read. If you know, if your dad is a judge, if your sister is a judge, please tell her to read chapter nine. I'm hoping it may help. All right. So, um, so the second one is the quality of the consent. So I. You know, it may be philosophically that somebody either consented or they didn't, but actually in real life it looks more or less dubious. So if a person clicks, I agree, did they really consent to what's in there? There's, there's not a consensus answer about that. Um, some people might say, well, you knew there are nasty things in there. It could have been a waiver of an important right. You didn't read it, and even if you did, you wouldn't be able to do anything about it. And so, okay, we're going to call that consent. I don't think that we should necessarily. Part of it depends upon the importance of the right. The, the analogy I would use, if you, if you turn to tort law, most everybody knows that, that um, hamburger that's not treated properly might have E. coli in it. So do we mean that any time I decide to buy a hamburger, I assume the risk that it might make me sick? We don't think that because there's an important right at stake and we don't think we consented to anything that's in there, even if we know that it might be in there. So, so I would say we look at the quality of the consent, we mush that together somehow. I don't, say, I don't think I have a full theory of how they interact with each other, but we, we put that together with the nature of the right. And, and then the third analytical parameter, I think, ought to be how many people are subject to this thing. Because if, if this thing is really widespread, it's changed the law for a lot of people. And, and if we're talking about important rights, like a, a system which actually respects freedom of speech or freedom of contract or, or the right to a remedy, then we have, in fact, undercut our whole system if we have millions of people who have, by receiving pieces of paper, quote, signed away these things. So I'm hoping that that will be a better thing for judges to look at, and I think some of them are sympathetic to the idea. But, but if the question were, to what extent could we ourselves aggregate ourselves to help with this, it would have to be, I think it would have to be some way of, of getting, uh, getting reputational pressure put on, on firms that do that. And I, one of the things I think would be good to do research on, and I haven't done myself, but I, I, I would like to have research done on it by somebody, is there are firms that don't do this. There are firms who sell products that would be dangerous if defective without any boilerplate whatever. Mountain climbing equipment is one. If that were defective, the person would fall off the mountain, but it comes without boilerplate purporting to exculpate them from any liability if their product's defective. And it would be good to, to, have, a, you know, to have a gallery of firms who do this in a good way and, and to, to promote that. So I wish someone would do research on that. I, that would be helpful, but I, I didn't for this. Um, do you have any ideas about it other than, it, you know? that we could do ourselves without having to use, um, to, to go to courts for it. it sounds like, I mean, from what you're saying, it sounds like to me it's a, a problem of gathering all the individuals 
yeah. and what I guess what class action lawyers used to do, you know, is collect yeah. all the people who are harmed and each and then sue them individually. Mm -hmm. And even if you can't do it in a class action, you're doing it in a yeah. community and informational way and so yeah. And yeah. So yeah, I'm hoping there's a way to to find out how often this is happening. Um, I think it's very prevalent to to sign away all the rights to things like right to privacy and publicity, like the boilerplate that I read you saying by by walking by here, we can take a picture of you, and in perpetuity throughout the universe, we can we can use it to advertise whatever we please. I think that's happening a lot, and and that changes what we think right to privacy or right to use of my name and likeness or just my likeness really is. It changes what the law is. So so I think we could find a way to draw attention to that. Um, in, in, but I'm not sure how we might do that. I don't have a good idea about that. And so if you do, please tell me. Yes. So, so as you know, I was very excited about this idea of uh, technology for um, helping with the process of doing custom Terms, yeah. custom it remains a very interesting question. Yeah. But I think before we talk about pricing so such things or negotiating such things, the first question is understanding such yeah. things. I think the biggest problem we have right now is the asymmetry yeah. that exists between firms that have paid their lawyers to craft these yes. extensive and opaque Right. Contracts and then put them out there for the individual who's going to spend three dollars to park his car and hasn't got the yeah. time to understand exactly what he's entering into. Right. So the question I wanted to raise is, before we talk about negotiating or purchasing, how do we confront the problem of this asymmetry of understanding? It's not even clear it's a real contract in some respect because it's not mutual understanding mm -hmm. of the terms. So what can we do? What can technology do to bring those issues? to the point where somebody understands what's important. And then we may develop markets whereby we pay mm -hmm. $3, whatever, for certain terms, check off, off those boxes or not. Is there yeah. any way we can, we can address that problem that you can see? That's an interesting question. There are some awful cases in case books which other people don't know about except when you're a lawyer. So there's a case which wrenches my heart. So I told the story of it in the preface to my book where um, a, a kid always looked forward to going on safari, and his his, his mother took him. But she had signed a she had signed some kind of exculpatory clause that he was dragged off by hyenas and eaten, and and she couldn't sue the tour company for being negligent. Well, and the and the father couldn't either because the mother had signed away all the rights for the child held the court in in that state, and then other courts will pick this up. So, so one thing I, I think we might do. I hate to say this, but you know the gross pictures we see of people who are victims of smoking. Maybe we should have some some gross advertising of of things that happen to people who become subject to these things. What do you think? But, I mean, I think there are advertisements like that, right? The yeah. Yeah, for, that's what that's what you see to get people to stop smoking, and and maybe we could get firms not wishing to do this if if there was going to be a picture of what happened to somebody who was subject to one of these. I mean, I mean, not that being able to sue somebody actually gets your kid back. So you know, it's the problem of compensation actually doing anything for anybody is an interesting philosophical problem too. But but if firms can. It's called a moral hazard problem. If they can just say, I push off all, li all liability for anything, it, it's a problem for, to keep them on the up and up, to keep them from doing things in a slipshod way, at least. So maybe deterrence is the only thing that we could, that we could do. So technology is not the solution? I don't think so. But I don't know, because I'm not very, you know, I'm not any more technolo technologic. I'm older, but not wiser as far as technology from when I was here. So I, I, I can't say, but I'm hoping to get suggestions. I, part of the reason why I'm here is I'm hoping people would help me. Yeah, okay. yes. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Well, what is, and this goes back to Julie's question about, you know, we're looking at contracting out of, of the fair use rights and things like that. Yeah. And there's a really interesting conference that's running on Saturday at Berkeley called Innovate Activate, which is about, you know, ways to um, create technological platforms for some of these IP issues coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the librarian community there
idea of pushing really hard and encouraging um, don't 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 buy those those subscriptions from the publishers yeah. um, that make you contact that or your fair use rights. Push back. Tell them no. We're going to use it. We're going to use it wisely within the the realm mm -hmm. of the fair use criteria. And yeah. and then and then let's see what happens then and see if the prices come down. The negotiations a little bit better. Right. Um, and I've been seeing a lot of chatter today uh, from the Harvard side on trying to create and uh, encourage their scholars to yeah. publish as open access instead yeah. of through traditional journals and maybe the, the credit you know, for, for having a, right. a traditional journal publication would be a little bit different, but it's, it's better for the quality of education and getting content spread right. out. So right. you know, I say all of this as maybe it's not a technological solution, but right. if you create a substitutable marketplace, right. uh, instead of having to force everybody down this channel where they've got to sign in to all these boilerplate contracts, if you create that, that separate right. channel around to be able to get the same result, it's not easy, but that's that's one right. avenue to to look at is, is just to start going down this road all together. Yeah, if we had enough people gathered together, there's if we had enough people who say, I'm not going to be a customer of yours if you're going to do this, uh, that that's kind of trying to organize a boycott. And I don't know whether that's been successful, but it would be interesting to It'd be interesting to see. I, I think there is a movement afloat, at least on behalf of younger scholars, to, to make their works available to other people and not allow these firms that gobble up journals to then start charging money. I, I think so. Is there research on this? I know there's definitely uh, I think there's uh, sort a of pushing on the open access uh, issue. I mean, so part of the problem is, um, you know, is there in fact, is this an issue in fact in which there's market competition, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's, I mean, a lot of the, I think a lot of the things that bother us bother us because we don't feel there's effective market competition on something there should be market competition, yeah. right? And what I yeah. hear you saying, and, I'm, and I agree, is the, the interest of freedom of contract has sort of diminished yeah. to the vanishing point in an agreement like That's this, right. and so we ought to care a lot more about what the background yeah. legal rules ought to be yeah. uh, and less about what the contract ought to be. I, now, you know, that assumes we get the background legal rules right. Um, right. I mean, I, you know, personally, I think the you can see, you don't get to sue me for right of publicity merely because I took your picture when you were in a public place is an example that I'm perfectly happy to have the world easily contract out of what strikes me as a dumb background rule. But by and large, right, the problem is is, is usually the opposite, yeah. right? Uh, which is we're, we're contracting out of rules that we created with good reason, and right. we're making it trivially easy to do that. Exactly. Piggy, I'm also wondering if, as part of the research for your book, you also looked into uh, other legal cultures, maybe. Because one of the things I found, you know, one of the many uh, startling things I uh, discovered when I moved to this country uh, was, you know, that the, basically the boilerplate being read out on uh, radio commercials. You know, I'm like, this is so <laughs> weird, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and I would see, you know, even coming from Europe, I would sort of view yeah. the U.S. culture as being sort of hyper-contractual in many ways, at least on a... Say that uh, again, please. Uh, hyper-contractual in many... I mean, in uh, there's a lot... No, compared to oh, Europe. Oh, here, yes, of course, so. yeah. Yeah, um, but one could... I could um, wax about this for another 10 minutes, but we don't have 10 minutes. But, uh, yeah, but yes, sure. I do have a chapter on what happened in Europe and is still happening, and, and, and with a little tidbit about Australia. And, and yes, we're the only big economy that is hyper-contractual in this way. And, and the others would be, the, you know, Europe is perfectly willing to have a list of clauses that are just not to appear in a contract with a consumer. And, and if our Federal Trade Commission wanted to declare that these things are prima facie unfair methods of doing business, they could do that, but they won't, because we're not politically right now oriented such that that could happen. And, but, but yeah, almost everything that we see every day here can't happen against consumers in other countries, especially the European ones. And I, I mean, I, I think the European economies are in difficulty right now, but not because they have certain rules about boilerplate that we don't have. So it's not that our economy will come crashing down if we have different background rules about, about boilerplate. But um, 
but he, in this country, I suppose I should end with this, it, it, because it's rhetoric. Uh, rhetoric on my part, but rhetoric on, on, on the, the people who are hyper-contractual, too. There's rhetoric about freedom of contract and, and free markets and how important all that freedom is. And, and the word free gets applied to things just as a matter of rhetoric, because you can't have a free market without setting up a market which has rules and enforcement mechanisms and, and competition. And so it, there's nothing free about it in that sense. It's, it's not a free for all. A free market has, has to have certain background rules. And, and the whole idea of private ordering requires background rules which are not part of private ordering. And so when these firms try to take private ordering into their own hands and make even that private, it kind of makes the whole idea of contract at least theoretically, come crashing down. So, so I'm worried about contract, but at the same time, I, I think a lot of these things don't have to be treated as contracts. And yes, if we could declare arbitration clauses in, against people who want to sue for violation of civil rights by an employer, if we could say that those should be heard by federal court, we'd be better off because they should be. But our Supreme Court says we, they're all arbitrable. So, so that, that's an open question. But yeah, thank you for the question because other countries don't do what we do and they seem to survive okay. So it's useful to take a, to take a comparative view of this. And I'm not an adequate comparativist, so I only have one chapter on it. But th this is an introductory book. Everybody should write books in response to this because I, I, I think once we have more publicity about what's actually going on out there, then we can figure out what technology could do. And I was hoping to have you tell me some things that technology could do now, and you have. But the main question of how to understand this is something that I've, I'm not sure that technology can do for us. It's an information problem. It is an information, information problem. Technology would help to solve that information problem. Yeah. We just have to figure out how to do it. But... I don't know. Well, thanks. <laughs> OK, on that note, uh, please join me in thanking you. Thank you very much.